All right, it's up and running. Um, so apologies, I didn't quite get this all in lecture time at this early part of the semester. Uh, there are these introductory lectures that I want to get through um, before we get to the heart of the course, which are the various case studies. So sometimes I try to pack more in a lecture than I would otherwise. Still, um, this is good to review. You can review it at your own pace. I say at your own pace. You can watch it multiple times or on the flip side. Panopto, if, in case you don't know this already, you can play it back at higher speeds. So if you want to risk listening to me at, you know, 1.25 or 1.5 speed, go for it. So I'm going to record this little video on the nature of scientific papers, on the parts of a scientific paper. Um, in discussion section, you'll be utilizing this information. So definitely watch this video. I'm also going to record another video right after this that's optional. And that is I cut, I cut out uh, some case studies of scientists as people, uh, some sort of science gone wrong examples for various reasons. Um, I'm going to have that available to you as a second video if you want to watch it, you want to learn a little about the history of paleontology, but I'm not going to test you on it. So it's just for your own edification. But this you got to know. So I talked about how papers are published in various journals. Um, and you know, here's from XKCD, which if you don't follow it, uh, is a great cartoon for science and science related topics, among many other things. But so what happens? The methods of science before you write it up are pretty much what I talked about in class. You've made observations. Uh, you've come up with hypotheses about the patterns you saw. You developed experiments to test those hypotheses. You've done analytical techniques. You get results. Those results might have some sort of uncertainty values. But what do you do with that? Well, you got to publish it. Um, so when you get around to publishing it, what do you do? Do you just do it by yourself, put it online, and let anyone look at it? Well, people used to do that. Well, not the online part so much. They used to self-publish a lot in the old days. And that's not horrible, but you could make some really horrible mistakes. Uh, and it's also a way that you can, a, a way that really wrong ideas can get promulgated. Because after all, you are probably your worst judge about your conclusions. Because after all, they're your conclusions, therefore you are ultimately favorable to them. Um, and as I talked about, as Feynman said, science is a process to keep us from lying to ourselves. So instead, if you're going to publish it in a journal, like here is actually Memoirs of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology with descriptions of the giant flying reptile Quetzalcoatlus and various aspects of its anatomy. Anyway. Um, normally what you do in modern science is you submit your paper to peer review. So you type up your paper, you send it off to a journal that you think it's appropriate for. You know, maybe you think it's popular enough for everyone in the scientific world to read, uh, and it's short enough that it could get into one of the weekly journals, um, so you send it to science or nature. Um, or maybe you think it's better in a journal in your own field, or what have you. So you send it to the editors there. The editors take a look at it. Uh, they might say, this is to the, <laughs> we're the journal of sedimentary geology. Why did someone send us a paper on, um, you know, the lives of stars? Um, and they just send it right back. Or they might see that even from the start, there's a major methodological flaw. And they'll send it back and say, we're not interested in it or you need to do some revisions before you send it to us again. But typically, you know enough about the field that uh, the researchers look at it and they go on and say, OK, this is worth being reviewed by your peers. So the manuscript is then sent out to two or three um, other researchers. Now, sometimes it's done. Uh, as a double blind. The peer reviewers never get to find out who wrote the paper, at least not when it's submitted to them. And the uh, authors never get to find out who peer reviewed it. In some cases, people do know the identities of both. There's merits to both methods, but the process is the same. So an editor calls you up, well, they'll call you up. They send you an email, and this happens all the time. In fact, I just got one um, momentarily ago before I recorded this. 
And they say, you know, here's the abstract. Are you interested in this? Do you have time to do it? I say, yes. Get the manuscript. You read it through. You look to make sure that they have the relevant information. Maybe there's a statistical test they didn't use that you think is much more relevant. Uh, maybe they misinterpreted their results. Maybe they're lacking some key bit of information that's already published, but somehow they didn't come across it. Uh, and if those are the situation, then you type up your notes explaining that and you send it back to the reviewer with your comments and also if you find typos or things like that you put that in there um, and then your evaluation do you accept the paper as is uh, is it accepted is it acceptable with minor uh, changes and you listen there does it require major changes do they have to rerun the analyses you have to specify what those are or should they reject it and if you argue that you have to make your case as to why the paper should be rejected so, you know, reviewer one sends in their review, reviewer two sends in their review. If there's a reviewer three or more, they send in their reviewers. The editor takes a look at them, evaluates those conclusions. Maybe the reviewers have radically different ideas and they so they'll want to send it out to yet another reviewer. Uh, maybe everyone comes to the same conclusion. If that happens, the editor is very likely to go with that. Or maybe the editor will look at it and says, these, editor, these reviewers, they were, they were off their uh, rocker. They, you know, I need to get, send this out again to another round. But hopefully, through this process, the paper gets winnowed back so that what gets through to be published is as good as it can be. Is it perfect? No. We live in the real world. No one's perfect. No one has total knowledge. But as the, to, get, to, get, to try to get as good a paper as possible. Now, of course, the acceptance for a publication is not the end. Just because you get your results published doesn't mean, and therefore, that's the truth. Rather, that means this person or this team, more often, had a anal set of analyses. They came to these conclusions. The editors, reviewers and editors found it worthy. It gets published. And then you read it and you say, those idiots, they clearly forgot my and someone else's paper or whatever. Um, but don't just sit there and complain about it. Do something about that. That is, write a response paper. And this sort of process is what's called reciprocal illumination. Um, you get your ideas published. Other people look at it. They challenge your ideas. Um, they may see, have new insights that you didn't have. They come back with their own response, their own responses, their own new papers, and it goes back and forth. So reciprocal illumination, you know, this team sheds light on a project or a topic, and then another team looks at that work and says, ah, I'm going to shed light on it in a new fashion, and so forth. So science is never done. It's a process. It's a method. It keeps on going. And hopefully what we're doing is getting closer and closer and closer to the objective reality that exists outside it, outside us. Might take some time. And to give an example of this reciprocal illumination, um, scientists get stuff wrong, but the only way you find out that they get something wrong is because people do more science. So back in 1922, this dude, Henry Fairfield Osborne, we'll re-encounter him again, very important figure in vertebrate paleontology, the study of, of vertebrate animals in the first part of the 20th century. Among other things, he's the uh, guy who named Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, he described, based on a weathered tooth, what he interpreted as the first anthropoid from North America. Anthropoids are the group that includes humans, great apes, lesser apes, as gibbons, and monkeys. Later on, we'll talk about what those terms mean, how they're not really biologically meaningful, and so forth. But that's what anthropoids are. Um, so he describes this based on a single tooth. Now, it seems strange, but a lot of fossil species are based on relatively, relatively limited evidence. Now, the popular news accounts describe this as being the first human, the first fossil human from uh, North America. They nicknamed it Nebraska man. They thought it was an ape man and so forth. In fact, his paper didn't say anything like that. He said it was simply an anthropoid somewhere in that group. But it turns out he was wrong. And the way we found out he was wrong is, again, other researchers. His colleague, William uh, King Gregory, um, looked at that paper. He went and then actually looked at the actual tooth. 
And then he compared it to other teeth of other creatures from the same rock units that he was familiar with, in particular a type of fossil peccary. Peccaries are pig-like animals common in the New World. Um, if you, you might know it by the Spanish name Javelina, uh, if you, especially if you live in the Southwest, you might know it by that name. Um, and it's not crazy that someone would describe a peccary tooth, a peccary molar, as being a an anthropoid molar, because just like us, peccaries are omnivores, just like anthropoids, and there actually are a lot of similarities in terms of tooth form. Um, and um, so it wasn't an incredible surprise. But Gregory saw this information, saw it contradicted what Osborne said, wrote up his paper, got it published, and then even Osborne agreed, ah, Gregory makes a strong case. And so we don't use Hesperopithecus Harold Cookei anymore. It's actually just a specimen, a very weathered specimen of Prosthenops, this peccary. So how about the anatomy of a paper itself? So scientific papers tend to have rather stereotyped structure. Um, and that's because you, the purpose of them is to convey information. Um, you want it to be well written, but they're not intended to be great works of literature. <laughs> the, the goal isn't to be really creative in terms of the way you tell the story or present the information, the way it might be if you're doing a novel or a poem or a short story. Um, so you want people to be able to easily retrieve the appropriate information and then go on and, and understand your work and, and maybe add to it. So lots of standard stuff. You know, we got a title. Sometimes it'll be super boring, straightforward. Sometimes it'll be a little more creative. Occasionally you'll have some, you know, funny quote or, or funny title to begin with or an artistic title and then a colon and then a more prosaic description. You've got the um, authors and their contact information. I say authors because many, not all, but many scientific papers these days are written by teams. And contact information, you know, there's going to be addresses and hopefully uh, email addresses so you can contact them. There's going to be an abstract, a condensation of the information. This is the, one of two parts of the paper that everyone's going to read. Everyone's going to read the title. If they're interested in the title, everyone's going to read the abstract. Sometimes it actually says abstract and then is set off from everything else. In this particular journal, this is PNAS. I mentioned it in class, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what they do is they put it in bold letters and the rest of the text is in non-bold, simple Roman. It's actually, you can see here, it's a slightly different font as well. And that's how you tell where the abstract is. So the abstract will give you the basic conclusions. Um, and then if you're interested in it, then you read the rest. So normally a paper will have some background material afterwards um, that leads you into what's going on. Why did people do this study? You know, history of previous work in the field, history if it is a, uh, a discovery of, say, of a fossil, maybe history of research at that site where it was discovered, or of that particular group of organisms. And the idea is to set the context of your research out there for people to see. But then, going to the hearts of the paper, are the methods and materials. And child of the 80s, so we've got method man and the material girl here. So. Methods and materials. The methods. What analytical techniques did you use? What equipment, if any, did you use? Uh, and this is important so people could try to duplicate your results. And then what specimens or particular observations were examined? Those are the materials. And then what happened when those methods were applied to those materials? That is, what were your results? So what came out of your analytical um, what, what came out of your analytical observations and your analytical methods at this section of the core of the course this, this section of the paper almost certainly there's where the key charts and the key plots come out uh, and I showed you example of, of so, some of those types of charts in lecture today um, and then a discussion section you got some results what do they mean are they consistent with previous hypotheses? Do they overturn previous hypotheses? Do they point towards new lines of research or were there broader implications? You know, why was the study important if it was important? And then finally, 
at the end, the conclusion. You summarize the major aspects of the paper. So there's the old saying about how you how you present information in the military. You tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Scientific papers do the same thing. Abstract, body, conclusion. And then, of course, afterwards, there'll be other things. There might be, um, well, there's going to be a bibliography or references so people can look up the related material. There might be, in fact, almost assuredly, there are appendices. Nowadays, many of the appendices may be online. In fact, in some journals, the methods and materials are also online. I'm not a big fan of that. I think if you're going to have a paper that's a physical paper, uh, you better have people have people have access right away to what your methods and materials are, but you know I'm not in charge of that. Um, now, if you go to a standard journal, like let me grab one here. Here we go. Here's a copy of Nature from uh, oh, how long ago was this? November, uh, yeah, November 13, 2014. Here you go, and in Nature here. There's more than just the main research articles, which are called letters in nature. I don't know why they're called letters, but they are. Uh, oh yeah, that's the reason I've got this here. We have a paper here, Resolving the Long-Standing Enigmas of a Giant Ornithomimosaur Dinochirus Morificus. Happened to have been a peer reviewer for that paper, actually. So there's more to a journal, though, than the technical research articles um, that are in there. Sometimes there are what we call review papers. A review paper is typically a little longer than your average research paper, a technical research paper, and it summarizes the current topics and current conclusions of a field. Honest to goodness, these are super useful if you're trying to find out about the state of the art, or rather the state of the science in a discipline. There are some journals that only publish review papers. Normally they'll have a statement review at the top if it's a different uh, if it's a journal that isn't one that's only reviews. Review papers typically do not present new analyses. That's not their function. Their function is a way of having a summary of many recent analyses with some thought on the part of the author of synthesizing them. Also there might be news reports really short uh, little articles, often written by the editors of the journal and don't even have a specific um, a specific author listed. So here, for instance, in Nature here, research highlights. Here we go. These are news articles, those are news reports about recent science that came out in maybe this journal or more often other journals. Um, just so people know what's going on in the field. Then there are commentaries. So commentaries are where an expert in the field explains why a paper, maybe in this journal, maybe in a different one, typically in that journal, uh, why it's important, why people should care about it. So for instance, here is a commentary by, oh, who is this jerk? Thomas R. Holtz Jr. Yeah, uh, writing about why, in this case, the Dinochirus paper later on in there, why it's important, why people should care. Not every article will have a commentary on it, but some will. If the editors decided a particular paper in their issue was really important, they'll get some other expert to basically translate the hyper jargon of the technical paper into merely scientific jargon. Then there are editorials, just like there are in many magazines and many things. Editorials typically marked off by the word editorial. There we go. Um, and there are the opinions of the journal editors, or maybe an outside expert, on issues related to the field. So they're not scientific discoveries, they're not a new analyses, they are the opinions of a professional about some topic relevant to the field. So these are things that are published in your standard scientific articles, so scientific journals that aren't just the research articles. But there's another class of material out there that comes from the technical literature, and those are conference abstracts. These are really proto-papers. These are the equivalent to the abstract of a paper, of a paper that's not actually been published yet. So before you get around to publishing your paper, uh, you go to a technical conference. 
and these are attended by dozens or hundreds or in some cases thousands of other researchers you know faculty members graduate students undergraduates um, technical professionals in the field whoever who want to find out what's going on and it's a way that people present their information to their peers and potential students and so forth prior to the published paper those abstracts get published uh, they may be published within the context of technical journals or may just be online but they're available you can search for them and they're not yet subject to peer review normally so some of the conclusions may not be as sound as after it's gone through period peer review but it gives you a sense of what people are doing in the field now those are the technical research papers, the te technical research journals and so forth. There are indeed popular science magazines. They used to be a little more common. They're still around, things like Scientific American, National Geographic, Discover, and so forth, uh, which some people confuse as science magazines. I mean, they, they are science magazines, but they're not where primary research is done. They're intended to translate the information from these places into stuff that an educated public person, an educated member of the public might want to hear about. So sometimes they're written by the scientists themselves, often they're written by science writers, by, by journalists who are special, specialists in writing about science for the general public. They're useful, but you wouldn't want to cite them if you were trying to talk about the real science. You would want to go to the original sources, the primary literature. And so when you get to a scientific paper, you know, take a look at it, think about the topic, read the paper itself, see if you could figure out what the authors are specifically trying to test, they say elucidate the hypothesis, figure out what it is they're trying to test, look at the data, see how they tested it, see whether they were effective in doing that, if their conclusions were reasonable from that and so forth. And if you are intrigued enough, think about the next experiment you would do. Um, almost any good line of research opens up the possibility of future research on the topic. You know, maybe you can now relate this thing to something else. Maybe there's some subset of the information they presented that needs more work. Science always grows. It's, as I said, it's never done. We keep on doing it. It's the process. It's the method that's important. And that's the nature of science.